there's the subject, there's the title. What are we going to do tonight? Well, um, what I want to do really tonight is, is get to the point to understand why Solomon writes the book of Ecclesiastes. At what point in his life is it um, and uh, why he does it? And to do that, we really have to start with the man himself. We need to look at him as a character. We need to understand him as a character. We need to see the things that he did, the actions, the communications that he had. Particularly, we need to look at the one chronicles, uh, sorry, the two chronicles, one record and the one king's three records, when he is before God at Gibeon, and look at what he asked for. And I think you may find that interesting. And perhaps when we look at this, it's not quite the character that you would imagine to see. Um, to back that up, we're going to be going through scripture and using the Bible to, to understand this man. We're going to look at the words of his father David because there's some interesting insight into the character there. And of course we're going to turn to the words of our father and his father, the Lord God in heaven, to see what he says, his testimony, as in his written word of Solomon. By doing so, we will perhaps get to an understanding of the setting of Ecclesiastes, the reason why he wrote this book, the historical background. And then when we know that, that will explain to us for tonight's talk uh, why all is vanity. So we're going to do this by looking into the scriptures at the character of, uh, of um, Solomon. Now, it's a good technique to have, isn't it, about keeping one hand in one chapter and one in another, and we're going to need that a little bit. So if you, um, if you do have uh, your Bibles open, please open them and uh, open, first of all, to 1 Kings chapter 3. And uh, whilst you're doing that, if you're wondering why we finished at verse 30 in our reading in Psalm 78, when it obviously continues, you'll see later why, um, and we will continue that reading together a little bit later. And you also need to keep one hand in uh, one King, uh, sorry, Second of Chronicles in chapter 1. Because we will flip between the two, because these are two parallel accounts of, of Solomon at Gibeon, really. And what we want to do is, is see what it is he actually asked for. And the two records are, are very much in sync with each other, but the language used in the two records is very different. Particularly the Hebrew that is used. It gives us a, a different insight into this man. And I, and I will say this, that perhaps we'll come out of this evening with not the greatest picture of the faith of this man, Solomon. But that's not the whole picture. That's only one point in time, um, and I will just uh, take us to one little verse towards the end where I believe that we can see the true character of Solomon, particularly towards the end of his life, um, in my uh, humble opinion, after he has written the book of Ecclesiastes. So 1 Kings chapter 3, um, right at the beginning, there is no need for this. There's never a verse in scripture that's not there for a reason, is it? And immediately when they're going to introduce us to Solomon and his kingship and to his first real act as a king, we're told this. Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The word affinity used there is only ever used in conjunction with marriage. So Solomon made, we know he made a marriage with his daughter, it's going to tell us that later on. But he made a marriage or a marriage vow with Pharaoh. Uh, um, obviously the writer's trying to tell us something about the character because that's wrong he shouldn't have done that he's already married isn't he yeah, he has a husband if you like as a bride he already is espoused to somebody and um, you know there are a number of places that we uh, can go to Ezekiel chapter 16 and uh, towards the end of that verse that's up on the screen where God says they shall be mine and, and the phraseology that's used there is, is, the, is the covering that comes from the sanctity of marriage. We could go to Hosea 2, to the free score record. I have betrothed thee, the Lord God says of Israel. Um, or Joel chapter 1, same language. That this is his bride. So he's already in a marriage. And I think what we're being told here is just a very quick and very insightful insight into the character of this man before we get to the events that are going to follow. The next thing that we're told is he sacrificed and burnt offerings in the high places. Now, the high places in Scripture are not always that easy to understand. It's not always that straightforward to understand. But there is a slight difference here. Um, and we'll see that perhaps the picture will grow as we go forward. 
We know, um, or I am uh, guessing that you understand, that there is a problem in Solomon's life with high places. We will see that later in 1 Kings uh, chapter 11, when God will rend the kingdom away from him, and he will say exactly why he's done it, and that is because his heart in his age has turned away from the God of his youth, which he writes in Ecclesiastes, doesn't he, uh, uh, to other gods. And they, he has placed in high places and built groves to and altars to. And so there we get the general picture of high places. I do accept that there are times when Abraham offers in high places and so do some of the patriarchal fathers and, and that's not an issue or it doesn't seem to be an issue. So when we look at high places it's about the phraseology that's around it and uh, it's about the, um, the context of the chapter. And so the first verse we're told is about his affinity to king of, uh, or Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and the taking of a foreign wife, which we know is, is not allowed under the law. And then the next bit that we're told about him is that he has the highest places. And in context, we understand going forward that those high places are places that would turn his heart away from God later in life. Well, we do know uh, Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 12 is an important chapter so let's just flick back there because we do know that they were told to destroy the high places of the nations around them um, these are the statutes Deuteronomy 12 says and the judgments which you shall observe to do in the land which the Lord thy God thy fathers giveth thee okay? verse 2 of Deuteronomy chapter 12 says you shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which you shall preserve serve their gods upon the high mountains upon the high hills and under every tree green tree and the language we don't have time tonight but you take this language of two, verses 2 and 3 forward to 1 Kings 11 and Ecclesiastes so the language of Solomon and see how much of this he actually did not destroy and that he actually built the complete opposite to destroy um, come down towards the end of uh, verse 3 and you shall destroy the names of them out of that place you shall not do so unto the Lord your God, but unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all the tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come. So there's a contrast. Don't look to these other gods in these other places, in these high places, these elevated spots. Look to the place where the Lord God has decided to put his name. Now we know that that is Jerusalem. Uh, the phraseology that's there, you just need to keep in mind because it will come up later. Even unto his habitation you shall seek. And the word that's used there means to make it a habit to go there. A discipline. It's where, it, when it's extrapolated forward into the Greek, we get the word disciple from. To make it something that's a focus and an intention of your life. 1 Chronicles says this. David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place which he had prepared for it. And it's why I find it really strange, and something that I can't completely answer to you, why Samuel would go to Gibeah. When David, his father, whose focus throughout his entire life is on Jerusalem, and we'll see later, verses that show his father's love for this place. And yet, here is a man whose first action is to go to the great high place, as it we'll see in a minute, it is called in Second Chronicles, at Gibeon. Not to the place where the Ark of God is. So there it is, it's called the high place that was at Gibeon. Um, so we're in 2 Chronicles chapter 1. 1 Kings 3 adds this to it, it was the great high place. And this is a flick in between the two chapters. Now that place, that means the great high place, have a look at it in, in your Strongs and in your dictionaries, doesn't mean the chiefest or the, or the best or the most glorious. It means, it, or it has the inclination, the one most full of pomp. Which is an interesting thing to say of the tabernacle, which is still described, by the way, as the tabernacle of the Lord. We'll see perhaps a little while later why that is the case. And I think it stems from that verse that's up there, 1 Samuel 4, 4, don't go there. But if you remember 1 Samuel 4 in the context, Israel were in battle against the Philistines and the battle wasn't going so well for them, was it? And so they thought, what can we do? What is it that we can do? And, 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 and they remembered back to the time when they were coming out of the land and they were sorry, coming out of Egypt and they were traveling to the land and when they first conquered into the land, when the Ark of God went before them in the battles that they won because of that. And so they say in their heads, 
uh, we need to go and get the Ark of God and bring it into the battle. But it's their emphasis that's wrong. 1 Samuel 4, 4 says this, when it cometh among us, it may save us. And because of that, God hands the Ark of God over to the Philistines. Because they had looked at the Ark of God, if you like, as a rabbit's foot, a lucky symbol, that it might save us. It was never the Ark of God that saved them. It was only God that could ever save them. And, and we could go to countless verses, couldn't we, to back that up. See, when Samuel, uh, Solomon sorry, comes to Gibeon to sacrifice before the Lord, which is the phrase that's used, which is, is the Hebrew phrase, Panium Yahweh, before the faces of the Lord that means the faces of the Lord, the cherubim isn't there so in Leviticus chapter 17 we are told that all sacrifices have to be before it says you can't ever go out of the camp you can't go and do it anywhere like that if you do that you're an abomination you should be cut off because you must bring them before Panium Yahweh some places it's Panium Elohim but Panium Yahweh or Panium Elohim before the faces of the Lord before the four faces of the cherubim to the Ark of Testimony where God is. Um, and there is another example in Exodus chapter 25. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the act and in the ark. Thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee. And it goes on, there I will commune with thee. There I will be. <coughs> and interestingly, the contrast between Solomon and his father. David, as soon as he brings the Ark of God to the tent that he would set up to the tabernacle that is in Jerusalem. He goes in and he sits before the Lord in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and 7, before Panion Yahweh, before the faces of God. What I'm suggesting to you is the problem with Gibeon is that although the sacrifices were ordained by uh, David to continue there, by Zadok and Abiathar, God wasn't actually there really, and I mean that in its pure sense because we all know God's everywhere. And where he required them was to come before the ark. And where he required the ark to be was, as we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 12, that was to be in Jerusalem. Just what's up there is just a, a, a quick, if you like, history of the tabernacle. So when they come into the land, the tabernacle's moved about an awful lot. There are a number of, of writers correspondents and uh, people who have exhorted from scripture who would suggest to you that the tabernacle was never needed the minute that they came out of Egypt and into the land that they should have known because there are plenty of scriptures we could go to and Deuteronomy 12 is, is the clearest of them all that God would put himself in Jerusalem and there are faithful men and women who understood this and David's family was one of them and we'll see an example of that a little bit later because if you remember back in Exodus, God said, so that I may dwell amongst them. And then it goes on to talk about that he would dwell amongst them because they were sojourners and pilgrims. Not that they'd come into a land where God said, I would plant them and would root them and I would, I would give them a place of peace, which, which is personified in its almost the greatest example before the kingdom of perfection under Solomon. But it comes into Shiloh, first of all, and there's the passages, then it goes to Nob for a very short period of time, uh, and to Gibeon for quite a, a considerable amount of time. But there is no ordinance from God for it to be in those places or for it to be moved between those places. And at the same time, David has set up a tabernacle in Jerusalem, which is where the Ark of God is. But here's a problem with what Solomon did because by going to the high places it tells us yeah, that the people continue to sacrifice in the high places no, not the high place but the high places see the king was always to be a spiritual leader of the land he was supposed to write the law out it was part of his duty he was supposed to help teach and interestingly in Ecclesiastes as we'll see later it's what he calls himself isn't it the teacher, the preacher one who exhorts or lectures is what that word means but by his actions, he had led the people astray. And we don't have time to look at all of this. There's an awful lot of evidence between the two chapters, um, 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles, to show that actually the people that Solomon takes with him are wrong. You know, when he goes up, he, he takes all the judges. He takes the cream of the crop, if you like, in modern day language. He takes those that he considers to be worthy to go. 
And that had nothing to do with fellowship, does it? No respect as a person, we are told over and over again. Not the way that the Lord works. He looks into the humble and contrite man. Um, Leviticus chapter uh, 26, again, let's not go to for time because we've got a lot to get through there. Um, they're told in verse 1 that they're not allowed to have idols, not to make graven images towards them, they're not to worship them. Uh, verse 11 to verse 12, he says, God says, so that's why my tabernacle is there, so that you don't do this, so that I, you may walk, I may walk with you, that you may, I may be your God and you may be my people. That's the essence of what he's trying to tell them. That's what the tabernacle was about. And Paniam Elohim and Paniam Yahweh are there in that chapter as well, so that you can come before the Lord. In verse 27, he says, And if you go after the high places as a nation, if you go after the high places, then I will put upon you sevenfold sin. And as I read this, from the point of Solomon onwards, all these become fulfilled in the nation of Israel. So the sevenfold sins that come are that your children and you will eat the flesh of each other, that I will destroy all the idols in the high places, my soul will abhor you, and I will take you into a land of desolation. I will scatter you amongst the heathen. I will draw a sword after you there and in Israel. And I will make your hearts faint there and in Israel. And you think of the language of their um, captivity. The proclamations in the chapters of the prophets against them before they go. Of what would happen and what happened when they were there. And you can see that they are fulfilled later. Because Israel went a-whoring after other gods. Here's that phrase that was there a little bit earlier. This is from Second Chronicles chapter 1. And it's, it's before he goes there, it tells us that Solomon went to the great high place and he sought unto it. And the idea is that in the past he's been there. And that he uh, continually goes there. The word um, means to frequent or uh, as it was his want, his habit, um, is the idea of it. Now, the word comes up in 2 Samuel chapter 15, in contrast again with David. When David would come to the top of the mount where he worshipped God, the top of the mount is, is the Mount of Olives. You can remember he's fleeing Absalom at the time, and Zadok brings the ark, interestingly, out to him, and he says, no, Zadok, that needs to go back into Jerusalem, to the place where God has put his name doesn't need to come with me that's where it is supposed to belong and so he sends it back and in verse 32 he it is rendered where the people worship God and the RV renders it this way where they traditionally or was their want to worship God and it's the same word and the idea here is that traditionally David and the people the faithful people who understood God's plan and purpose with Jerusalem tried to get as close to that Jebusite city as they possibly could, because that's what it was at that time, before David had obviously captured it. Uh, and as they tried to get as close to that place, the closest place was the place on the top of the Mount of Olives where they could see, and there they had set up some form of worship. Uh, and it's a fleeting comment there in Second Samuel 15, but one that gives us an insight into David. It's backed up if we go to Psalm 132, actually. And in Psalm 132, which is a psalm, I think, written when David has spoken to Nathan about building God's house. Uh, it's a small song, Song of Degrees, one that they would read as they were going up to the temple, or sing, would probably be more accurate. They'll all remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty one, uh, the mighty God of Jacob, surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed, I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord, a habitation or a tabernacle for the mighty God of Jacob. Okay, so there's that conviction that he shows to Nathan to build this house. Look at the next verse. Lo, we or I can be translated the evil way, heard of it in Ephrata. We know from Micah 5 that that's Bethlehem. So David is saying, I heard of this place where, I was gonna, where the habitation of God has got to be built when I was in Bethlehem. Well, at this point, he hasn't been in Bethlehem. And a chronological order of, of the Dravidic line is very hard to decide. But for 30 years, 35 years, yet he still remembers it. And look at this um, in the next uh, line. Lo, we heard of it in Frater. We found it in the fields of the wood. In the Hebrew, we found it in Kerjath Jirim, the city of the forests or the fields of the woods. 
which is exactly where he brought the ark up to Jerusalem. And so it's always been David's focus. When he was a child, his father would have taken them, the shepherd duties out and, uh, with his brethren, and they would have stood on the Mount of Olives, I'm suggesting to you, that place where they traditionally worship, where he used to go with his family, and look at Jerusalem and be, a, and be the focus of it. And it's there in Psalm 132, which makes it really hard, doesn't it, to understand why Solomon's focus is not in Jerusalem, and yet it's at Gibeon. And there you see David bringing it up from Kyrgyz German, 2 Chronicles chapter 4. Come back to 1 Kings chapter 3. Because I just want to show... We're going to look at the discourse between God and Solomon in a minute, but there's a little bit of information in here, or, there, or as in many cases, there's a lot of information that we are not told. And I don't think what we've got written down in either two records is all of the conversation that God had. So I've just suggested to you that where David went was, uh, sorry, where Solomon went was the wrong place. He went there in the wrong way, by the way. And if you look at this and, and the duty of a king to offer sacrifices, he went and he offered the wrong sacrifices. So uh, when he goes up and he asks, it would seem on paper for the right things. Come to that in a minute. Um, but come down to verse 15. When Solomon awoke, so after he's had this dream, this vision, and God has spoken to him, and it's the first of two, isn't it, that he has, and behold, it was a dream, he came to, where? To Jerusalem. And what does he do? He goes and stands before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. He now knows where he's supposed to go. Panir Yahweh, before the faces of God. And he takes burnt offerings and now the right sacrifice together with it for a king and peace offerings and now look he makes a feast of fellowship that word is a wave offering to all his servants not just to the cream of the crop anymore but to the whole of the nation of Israel or those representatives of that in every class and every culture that there was from the poor to the very rich who dwelt in Jerusalem And these are just in Second Chronicles 1. It's interesting, 1 Kings chapter 3 starts with the character before we have the discourse, and Second Chronicles chapter 1 gives us the discourse and then gives us the character of Solomon uh, and his kingship. And so what we're told there is that he would gather chariots and horsemen, yeah, that he would, the king would make silver and gold in Jerusalem as plenteous as stones, and Solomon had horses brought, or he traded in horses out of Egypt, all things expressly forbidden for the king of Israel to do. We'll have a, a little bit. That's Deuteronomy chapter 17, isn't it? That he could not do those things. Okay, so let's have a look at what um, he asked for. So he asked for, uh, depending on your version, and depending on how it's written, he will ask for wisdom and understanding, uh, are the general um, uh, way that they're translated. But the word wisdom that's used there is not the one that Solomon will use when he writes through the book of Proverbs or the book of Ecclesiastes. It's not that word. That word, if you look in Strong's, that he does use in our readings that we're reading in Proverbs at the moment, if you look at it, we'll say wisdom, in a, and it has abbreviated comments, in a good sense. And then says wisdom, knowledge, intelligence, godly understanding. The word that's used here is one that has the idea of cunningness not the other one and it's a very frequent word in scripture used of a lot of people and the word that he uses in 1 Kings chapter 3 to rule is the word to judge with punishment to be an oppressor as it is translated elsewhere uh, and the word that's used to discern or to have understanding is the word that's used to mentally separate and it's cunning again it's the word that he will demonstrate in the next bit of this chapter when he will literally threatened to discern in cunningness or to cut in half that child but when he asked for these things we wouldn't expect God to give them to him would we if we uh, go to the New Testament for example who if his father uh, whom if her son asked for uh, bread would give would the father give a stone to but the point is, what I'm suggesting to you is that God gives him exactly what he asks for. He uses the same phraseology, the same words. He gives him wisdom, the cunning, the subtlety. He gives him the understanding, the discerning, the cunning that is needed. Why? Well, 
We'll see that a little bit later, I think. Perhaps it's because Solomon asked for a stone. He didn't actually ask for bread. And so God gave him a stone. And I think there's a telling phrase that's in Romans 9 and Ephesians, Ephesians 1 and 2. You know when it says that we, and it talks about the gifts that we get, particularly the eternal salvation that we get, and the riches of his glory when talking about Jesus. Sometimes we get the things that we absolutely need to have. Not necessarily what we want, not always what we ask for. Maybe that's what's going on here. The riches of Christ's glory to us aren't necessarily, in a worldly way, always good things. They sometimes bring challenges into our lives. But in the ultimate, that phrase is used about our eternal salvation. And so it's true of Solomon. It must be true of Solomon. Uh, in 1 Kings 3, Solomon then, as we've just seen, asks for this. And there's a dilemma because in 1 Kings 3 there is this. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. So if he's given him the things that are not necessarily that good for him, why would it please God? Well, it's an unusual cluster of Hebrew words. Um, and, and, and my understanding of this and the commentator suggests that it means an accepted affliction. Yeah, an understood outward appearance. It is very closely connected to the word that's used for eye in scripture as an eye of the beholder for example or beauty is in the eye of the beholder i.e. it's superficial but God was pleased to give it to him because it was an accepted affliction something that would be now there's, it's not used very often that cluster but another time it's used in Isaiah 53 when God speaks about how it pleased him to bruise his son not, not what we would expect but it was an accepted affliction why? because of the end product and I'm suggesting to you that's exactly what God is doing with Solomon here. So come to Psalm 78, so we can continue our reading, really. Uh, Tom didn't finish a verse short uh, by accident. That's exactly where I asked Nathan to get Tom to finish. Um, I just want us to whiz right down through there. Because, see, there's already a precedent for this. Collectively in the nation of Israel, God has already done this. He has given them exactly what they asked for, even though... In a worldly sense, it was not good for them. Because ultimately, it would be good for their eternal salvation. So, these, that, what's on the board, you can just quickly scan. Those are the things that they asked for. And they weren't blessings. The quail, the manna, those things were not blessings for Israel. They were a consequence of their sin or their lack of faith. Do you remember when they came out of the land, the commentators tell us, as written in Psalms, that there was not one feeble one amongst them. Excuse me? In Exodus chapter 3, we've been told about the oppression that they had, the affliction under the taskmasters. There was not one feeble one amongst them when they left. Because God was going to sustain them. And, and, the, and Moses' um, song that he sings before uh, the events of Exodus 15, which is what Psalm 78 is talking to us about, says that God was going before them in his power and might to sustain, to lead them in the Hebrew. But Israel couldn't trust in that. If they had... The comments that come when they're in the wilderness journey, i.e. their shoes and their coats would not wax in, that they would not fade away, would have been true about food and water. They never needed it. Eleven days journey, they would have been in the land of promise. They just had to trust. And they couldn't. That's what's going on in Psalm 78. They just could not trust. And so, they have water from what? They sinned more. They tempted God in their hearts. Trusted not in his salvation. There it is. So God gave them manna and quails. He gave them their own desire. Verse 29 says. Exactly what they wanted. Verse 30. He did not estrange them from their lust. For all this. It goes on to say. They sin still and believe not for his wondrous wax. Therefore their days. And look at the language of Ecclesiastes. Did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble? And, you know, in Ecclesiastes, those brethren after me doing the studies will see that those verses, vanity and trouble, come up together. I can count over 14 times in Ecclesiastes. The language is the same. Why? Because ultimately this is what they needed to get to the land. They had to go through the trouble, the affliction, the 38 and a half years wandering, the lack of faith to ultimately trust in God to cross over that Jordan into the promised land. Solomon had to do exactly the same. Um, up on the board are the parallel accounts of 1 Kings 3 and 2 Chronicles chapter 1 again. And these are God's comments to him. And I think there's an insight here, particularly in 2 Chronicles chapter 1. And these are the things, if you like, he didn't ask for. But the idea or the suggestion here is they were already in his heart. He didn't voice them, but God knew them. 
and he gives them to him anyway as well. So, because thou hast asked this thing, which was for wisdom and a son, and has not asked for thyself long life, neither of riches, and, and they're the same in both accounts, nor has asked the life of thine enemies, which the parallels to Saul as a king and, and Solomon are, are, are great. Nor has asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding, discern, judgment. I have also given thee then that which thou hast not asked. Not that that which thou did not desire or not want, but what you did not ask. Second of Chronicles is more emphatic. Because this was in thy heart, he says. And the Hebrew, the force of the Hebrew is there. Not it was in your heart to ask for wisdom, but because this was in your heart, i.e. wealth, honour, nor life, but you didn't ask for it. Yeah, I'm going to give it anyway. Because it's what you really and truly want. Now we're going to turn to the words of his father David. There are only two. There are only outside of the writing, the, the chronicles and the king's records, um, one account of Solomon uh, and Samuel. Sorry, um, and then in the writings of Solomon, outside of that, there are only five times that Solomon's mentioned in Scripture. Um, sorry, six times that he is mentioned in Scripture. 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, and Psalm 72, two Psalms. The other one is Psalm 127, which are Psalms for Solomon. Yeah. Uh, the first one of these, if you like, is about kingship, and this is David's understanding of the character of his son. You can read it up there. And he says to him, you've got to ask for a perfect heart. When we go across in a minute to uh, 1 Chronicles 22, you see it's even more emphatic again. You've got to ask for a perfect heart and a will in mind. Why? Because God understands what's in there already. Just as he does for you and I. He can search and seek. He knows. So you need to ask for that which you lack. You need to ask for God to make it up a little bit. And there's, if you like, a, a fulfillment here in the life of Solomon, isn't it? In the words of his father, if thou seek him, that's that word, if you make it a habit, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee or rend thee off forever. Exactly as we will see what happens. Uh, Psalm 72, give thy king thy judgments of God and the righteousness unto thy king's son. 1 Chronicles 22, they are in verse 5 plus, but verse 12 is what we want. Only the Lord, he says to Solomon, give thee wisdom. This is the right wisdom now. And understanding, it's the right understanding, not the things he asked for. Give thee charge, i.e. to enjoin, make fellowship with Israel, that thou mayest keep. Remember, David always acted as a king priest, or, or not always. He tried to always act as a king priest, didn't he? Um, to hedge about the priestly law, the law of God. In Psalm 127, uh, a man who was commissioned by God to build the house of God doesn't understand that really what he should have been building was the spiritual house of God. But here, his father writes, except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain that build it. And again, look, it's a song of degrees for Solomon. So there's an insight perhaps into the character of Solomon as David saw it. We aren't going to go to Acts chapter 7. Um, but basically in Acts chapter 7 what we see is, is the complete understanding of David about the imp and the patriarchal fathers of the importance of Jerusalem in building God's house and how David wanted to do it and the comment says but Solomon built the house then it goes on to quote Isaiah chapter 66 which is going to come up on the screen Thus saith the Lord, the heavens is my throne, the earth is my foot so where is the house that you build unto me and where is the place and ironically Solomon will quote these words, or he will say these words first, and Isaiah 66 is a quote to them. I'd, uh, chronologically, it has to be that way. For all those things have my hand made, and unto all those things have been, saith the Lord. He quotes that, but he doesn't put this bit in. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. And what I'm suggesting to you is a body of evidence is that it wasn't in Solomon to be like this. He wasn't naturally a spiritual man. Just as digression, do you know what the first and last acts of Solomon are in Scripture? Don't know if we're allowed calling out, but I've invited it anyway. The first acts of Solomon as king. The first was the express murder of free men. They might have deserved it under godly law the last one was the attempted murder of Jeroboam a man whose name means peaceful or peace did an act in his first and last bookends of his life that are recorded for us in a very peaceful way 
But here's the interesting thing. There are about four verses in these chronological accounts that show that God did give him also the right type of wisdom and the right type of understanding. The body of evidence says that God gave him exactly what he asked for. But here's one, 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse uh, 29, that God gives him, and that is the right words, the things that his father David exactly asked him to ask for. So contradiction? No, don't believe so. I believe God gives us every good and perfect gift from above for us to get to the kingdom. Sometimes the good and perfect gifts we get are not in the way that we expect them, and sometimes they are. And so jo Solomon is given all that worldly stuff, and he's given all that spiritual stuff. He's just got to choose with the character that he's got inside him, which one he's going to develop, which one that he's going to use, which one he's going to communicate, which one's going to be his motivation. And what we'll see, unfortunately, is that he doesn't demonstrate that. If you go back to 1 Kings chapter 3, uh, we, where we were, and have a look what he does. So we see very worldly knowledge and wisdom in verse 16 onwards with the two women. Do you know, at no point in the life of Solomon does he give glory to God or do the people coming to him. The only one, the only one who gets it is the Queen of Sheba. She says, the Lord gave you this. Every other person comes, as we'll see in a minute, uh, I'll put it up, to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Yeah, to hear his words. Now, you take, for example, Joseph or Daniel or the Lord Jesus Christ. When they saw the mighty works and the miracles, who did they give glory to? God. Solomon, that's not the case in his life. Uh, and, and in 1 uh, Kings chapter 3, we have that. In chapter 4, he sets out the provinces. He changes the political order inside the land. He actually moves some of the borders that are ordained, if you look at this closely. Yeah, and he establishes provinces and governors above them, more than what they needed to be. Then he begins to place and fortify cities, build up a military strength, <coughs> and to trust in it. And what's missing from here are those things in Deuteronomy chapter 17 that God said the king must do. For example, write out the law. He does all the things that God warned them the king would do. Every single thing. But he doesn't do the things he should have done in a spiritual way either. And this is just very quick, this last bit, this bit that's here. Can you tell me, and it's up on the board there, so that's not a bit, but can you tell me if you have a, an idea or an understanding, and maybe it, and it'll be better than mine, that I'm absolutely sure, how many accounts outside of scripture there are of David? So historical, cultural accounts. Anyone got an idea? I could find four. Three Babylonian Assyrian type ones, and one Egyptian. A lot of records. There are over 400 for Solomon. Yeah, 15 different cultures, those are some of them. And these are some of the myths that have grown about the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, probably uh, the most, um, one that's known the most is the Seal of Solomon. Yeah, the ring, the picture that's there. Uh, the Ring of Solomon, which was ordained with the living name of God and therefore had the express power to contain and control angels. Transferred in the cultures around them, the rabbinical teachers used to promote this, but in the cultures around them as being able to control demons which he was really known for, and flying carpets and uh, different occasions. And do you know, in actual fact, in the Persian records, the book of Ecclesiastes is written because he's trying to trick Asmodeus, which is the chief of demons. Yeah, Asmodeus tricks him, spits him out, vomits him out, same language as Jonah, 400 miles away, and he has to walk back through, wandering through the land, thinking, what have I done so wrong to get his kingdom back? And they say, that's where Ecclesiastes come from. The preacher who wandered, as Ecclesiastes says. Interestingly, it's the same ring that the Masons believe they have. That the head Mason holds the ring of Solomon with the divine power of God in it to save the world yeah, in the establishment of Solomon's kingdom one day. The reason I tell you that is because Solomon sought and courted worldly renown. That's why these many people knew about him. Whereas David didn't. He sought and courted those things that were important to God. So summary up until this point because I'm conscious of our time. There they are. He had affinity with Egypt, made far and wise, and kept the high places, led the people astray, gathered to himself <laughs> military power, silver and gold, political alliance, worldly renown, requests were worldly intelligence, cunning, rule and oppression, worldly honour and reputation before men. Not a pretty picture, but it's not the entire picture. We're only looking at the introduction of Ecclesiastes, remember. Okay, so the setting of Ecclesiastes, what's that got to do with it? 
Matthew chapter 7, unless, think of Psalm 127. Okay, and this is about building our house upon the rock, upon the sure foundation of God. And if you do that, we know that it stays. But if you build it upon the sand, as we know from the Sunday school, then comes the rain and rest of rights. Why? The winds were blue, beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And great was the fall of Solomon's house. 1 Kings chapter 11. Um, just open your Bibles to that a moment. You can just follow, really, because of time. I'm mean, going through the, the different verses that are up on, up on the, the screen. Uh, strange women. Verse 2 to 8, strange gods. These are all the things about God talking to Solomon about um, his, his um, land and um, what he's done wrong. Uh, kingdom was rent away. I think I've given you the wrong chapter up there anyway, haven't I? Nope, that's right. 1 Kings chapter 11. Um, Verse 9, the anger of God was against him. Yeah, why? Because in his heart he had turned away from the Lord God of Israel. So verse 11, he will rend the king away. Verse 31, to absolutely cement the fact, he tells him again it will be rend away. Why? Because he leads Israel away as the greatest of his sins. And believe me, if you go back to 1 Kings chapter 9 and see the consequences to Israel, yeah, for going away from God. It wasn't just them. The land would be punished. <laughs> they would be punished as well. And God says he would absorb their soul. So that when we get to 1 Kings 11, we see that fall of his kingdom. And the rest of the acts of Solomon and all that he did and his wisdom, are they not written, sorry, it's read away, are they not written in the book of the acts of Solomon? Now, there are a lot of commentators who say this, and this is not a, a, a thought that's my own. Indeed, if he was here tonight, Brother Bernard Burke would tell you that it's a, a thought that he has as well. Um, but there's that verse again, and the rest of the Acts of Solomon and all that he did and the wisdom, they are, not writ- are they not written in the books of the Acts of Solomon? And you'll say to me, we don't have that book. My suggestion to you is, yes, we do. The word Acts is the word Dobo, which should be translated word, and it is translated most times. So if we now read, and the rest of the words of Solomon and all he did, are they not, in his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the words of Solomon? Okay, and it's, it's a word that's used to teach or to tell or to preach. Yeah, that's the word. Ecclesiastes 1, there it is, right at the beginning. These are the words, Dorbor, of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And that's my suggestion to you. That's the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Solomon. That at the time when Solomon stands there and realises, probably within, I think he's about 68 years when he dies, 40 years he reigned. And this is probably about a year to 18 months before the end of his life. And God has said to him, it's gone, Solomon. Everything that you built, everything that you thought was important, everything that I entrusted to you is gone. I've rented away. I'm going to give two to your son because of the tender mercies for David, not because of you, Solomon. And I'm going to give ten to Jeroboam. And he tries to kill Jeroboam, as we know. But he now knows it's all gone. So when we go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, which is our chapter for this evening, and we're going to be brief here, as I'm sure the brethren following me will do greater exhortations on these words because they're not just in Ecclesiastes 1 or 2, they come up throughout the scripture. 1 to 3, the words of the preacher, the son of David, the word that's used throughout Ecclesiastes about all that's under the sun is the whole, the everything. There is not one thing, he says, that is not vanity. And the word that's used for vanity is the word Hebel, which is the word Abel. Yeah, or the name Abel. It's a, deri- uh, a derivation of it. And it means that which fades away because of Abel uh, dying in the manner that he did at such a young age, like grass that fade off. It just, poof, gone. It was all that. It was of no value at all. You could reach for it, but it would be just gone. It was all temporal. It was all transient. He says everything. And so there he goes in Ecclesiastes 2. He lists these things. These are all the things in Ecclesiastes 2 that he says were just vanity. And look at the language of this. If you go through the life of Solomon, every single one of these, every single one, he did. These were the labours of his hand. It was all. So that when we get to the end of chapter 2, right towards the end, in verse 24 of the end, he can say this, I now understand that everything I had was from God. Everything. I didn't appreciate it. I didn't realise it. All those good gifts that I had were from God and I used them for my own gain and not 
for the gain of his glory or even for his son who I believe and I'll just one verse to finish in a minute uh, he understands but look what he says if you were to go back to 118 you will see that he understands that there is there is wisdom and knowledge that bring forth grief and sorrow and trouble and then at the end of the chapter he says and now I know that there is wisdom and knowledge that bringeth forth joy he now understands the good gifts the true wisdom and understanding that God gave him and those are the words the correct ones that God gave him so that he can say that he may give to him that is good before God so he says so I would give him good gifts I would, there is wisdom and understanding that bring forth joy why so that I could repay it so I could bring it the language is sacrificial language so that I could give it I could sacrifice it I could bring it before whom? Pania Elohim Pania Yahweh that I could bring it before the face of God he says anything else is vanity of vanities um, so um, I just want because that was very negative and just to finish I don't believe that Solomon was all bad I think the end of the man is excellent and it's not it's not in Ecclesiastes we need to go to the very last verses of the Song of Solomon for me to demonstrate this to you so please come to chapter 8 and verse 14 so what we've seen tonight is I don't believe naturally inside this man just like in naturally our natural tendencies of many of us is not to be godly yet yeah, actually with the good gifts God gives us we are so sometimes caught up in our own world and our own uh, understanding and pride in self renown that we, we forget that we are supposed to use these things in the service of God and so when we come to the book of Ecclesiastes Solomon understands that and writes that book and everything is a vanity because it's all gone now and he realises there's only one good thing which is not my subject yeah, but that is, uh, there is only one thing and that is the whole measure of man is to keep the commandments of God but why do we go to 14? Because a man who doesn't understand the plan and purpose of God, a man who cannot see the Lord Jesus Christ, cannot write these verses. Song of Solomon will be a subject for another day, but it's simple here. This is a bride saying to our absent Lord, hurry up and return. Make haste, my beloved. Be thou like to a roe or to a young heart upon the mountains of spices. And the Hebrew means make haste and return, my beloved. Thank you.